cases that I'm doing just the floor. I'm not doing a shower or a backsplash or anything else, only the floor. So this is a dining room uh, kitchen combo. And this entire floor, almost 300 square feet, and roughly about 250 to 70 or so. There's 300 square feet of tile because there is um, cuts and waste. So you always want to make sure that you bump up your number and I always measure out to my highest number. So if this is 14 and a half, that becomes 15. If this is, you know, 25 or 25 and two inches, that becomes 26 to me. So I always go to the higher number when you're measuring out and then add in another 10% for waste. That way you have enough tile. All the tile is right here, ready to go. This is an elongated tile, a large format, 12 by 24. And that will get in thirds rather than in half. So I'm going to stagger it in thirds, go in this direction all the way over. Uh, just a couple of tips for you if you decide to do your own floor. This is an older house. I think this house was built sometime in the mid 60s, uh, maybe into the 70s. Either which way it's been around for a while and so there has been a little settling with regard to the floor. Um, I can just walk across it and I can kind of feel some of the discrepancies I think there's a little dip going this way, so going over here, it seems to be because all the weight is on the wall, this dip matters. And you have to make sure when you travel out your thin set that you take up for that. Um, you, follow, you follow your tile, you don't follow the floor. If you follow your floor, you're in trouble. So I always follow my tile. And if you can see on here, there's a very, very slight gap. Uh, when I put my level down on the floor, it's, it's touching over here and it's touching over here, but there's a gap. So when you're doing a floor that you know is uneven, you should always anticipate that, put a little bit more thin set down than you normally would, back butter your tile, and then follow your tile all the way across. Don't follow the floor. If you follow the floor, as I said, you'll get in trouble with lippage type issues. Um, so that's one thing. Other thing is, I'm getting ready to put a uh, backer board down here. Oh, by the way, when you're thinking about putting a backer board product, please, please don't use the Curtis Fluter stuff, Beetra, for example, which another tiler on YouTube, named those unmentioned, seems to really like for any floor that he does. I don't like it. I don't like it for a lot of reasons. Um, he probably thinks it's less work because he's just traveling out thin set and putting the Beetra on top of the floor letting that dry and then putting the tile on. Um, that actually would slow me down because once I put the Dietra on, I can't do any tile, I gotta come back the next day. But more to the point, that stuff is a bear to take up. I'm gonna post a video down below and you can watch that video and see what a pain in the ass that stuff is to take up. And I had a lot of comments from people on stuff like that that say, well, that's the next guy's problem. Why are you worried about it? Because I am the next guy sometimes, and so I don't want to do something to make things more difficult for the next guy, but also it doesn't do you any good. It doesn't, it doesn't better your floor. It doesn't better the installation process. It doesn't do anything for you. Backer board is still pain the way I put it down because I'm using roofing nails, and it's a lot of nails, or even screws if you use them would be still a pain, but it's manageable, and it doesn't tear up your subfloor. Dietra tears up your subfloor and it's a real pain to get off and there's absolutely 100% no need for it. No need at all whatsoever for Dietra. So the backer board I'm using is Durarock and it's going to be quarter inch because we have this um, we have this thick carpet and thick pad going on here and by the time I put quarter inch and I put the tile down then I should be flush with the carpet. So that's, that's the reason I'm using quarter inch. Also know something else. Back in the day, all the way up until 1981, asbestos was used in almost everything in a house, from the sheetrock to the sheetrock mud, to your countertops, the material of your countertops, to your flooring, every flooring, tile, thin set, grout, mortar, everything, including linoleum, had asbestos in it. And let me just briefly, if I can, explain the reason, and I went through a course years ago, so I know about this stuff. Asbestos is microfibers of, if you think of fiberglass, it's micro, 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 it's much, much smaller than fiberglass. Um, so when they added that product into all these different materials, it made the material stronger and better for a lot of different reasons that I won't go into, but because they used it in everything, when you start taking this stuff out, 
then all those particles of asbestos get airborne and then you breathe them in. Um, unlike fiberglass, you can cough that stuff out and it's not embedded in your lungs forever. With asbestos, it gets inside of your lungs and it's cumulative. So you have an exposure this time and then next time and the next time and eventually you get mesothelioma, which is not good. And so I try and cut down on my exposure and you should too. Um, so for that reason, uh, linoleum is almost never taken up unless it was just put down five years ago or ten years ago and where they did linoleum they only glued the perimeter so that I actually can pull it up but you have an opportunity either which way to put the, um, the Durarot directly onto this linoleum um, and so that way you're encapsulating any type of exposure that you might have and there's no reason to take it up anyway um, going forward from this from that point I will start setting my tile Normally I set at the side that gets seen the most, and since there's three doorways here, and that one being the garage door, there's three doorways here, more than likely I will start at either this corner, or I'll start at that corner, and I will run a row of tile all the way down, and then all my following tile work their way out, and the math is what it is. You know, if I end up down here with a smaller cut, by the time you have a dining room table and all that stuff, you're not seeing that smaller cut. The dishwasher is removed, so the tile will go under that. The refrigerator is removed, tile will go under that, and eventually there'll be quarter round. So if there's any other tips I can give you along the way, I will be sure to mention that as I move forward on this job. It's a little rare that I read directions on things, otherwise I would have to turn in my man card. But I just happened to look at this box of tile I'm going to be putting down, and it even tells you on here, like the manufacturer tells you, um, yes, do it on thirds. No, don't do it in half. And for that reason that I already mentioned, um, because you get the waviness, these tile, when they're burned, are not exactly straight. It's not a straight tile. Therefore, there's a little bit of bowing that occurs and when you do it on thirds you cut down on your lippage um, so that you don't have this situation going on which I referenced on uh, a couple other videos that I've made uh, in this case on the floor this is an older house none of the walls are straight this wall is where I want to start at and I wasn't able to because when I did a measurement for my door jam um, which is right there and right there the measurement was off so that I ended up with a skinnier area here and a larger area back there um, which won't work so inevitably what I had to do is go from my other wall um, going from that wall furthest wall over over there in the corner and over here about an eight foot span and do a measurement that was true that was less than the tile size that I want in here this will be about an 11 inch cut 10 and 3 quarters, something like that, instead of a 12 inch cut. Um, but I have it true now. So I have basically a ledger board um, resting up against that. And if you see the pencil mark, it goes all the way down. And so the size from the wall to the line is about the same going all the way down with a very slight discrepancy toward the end. Um, but the board is true and the line is true. And that's what we'll work off of. So the first row of tile will actually be butted up against this board that's screwed down to the floor and I'm going to run a, another board all the way down there and then the tile will go outward from this direction and then eventually come back over here as I do in showers when I have a ledger board vertically um, the, the first one will go last uh, and that's the easiest way to kind of square out an unsquare room so this is where I am at a couple hours later with this tile project as you can see my ledger board is taking up that space all the way down. My tile is pushed up against it, very solid, and all my spacing is even. Third spacing is going on, so this first row will be replicated again. Once I get over there, there'll be a full tile, and then two thirds, and then one third, and then as I get further back, that will continue the process. Uh, makes it relatively easy, but it also is very redundant. And it's boring, speaking of which, um, a lot of times I, I get asked how come I don't show my work. Other uh, tilers out there are showing fast forward videos of them working. 
and you know I see the video posted and I'm like really 105 minutes I'm not gonna sit there and watch somebody work even at fast speed for 105 minutes that's not gonna happen uh, but just to um, appease some of those people I will show a very small process I'll probably do three tile for you so that you can kind of see the pro it's it, tr really it's really boring to me and I don't know why people want to see it but I will show it but I will do I will do a couple of rows so that you're able to kind of see how I do things So this is the next day. The next day all this tile is set and dried and ready to be grouted. However, I still have this whole other area to do. So I'm going to go three more rows coming all the way back and then the last couple, I think it's like two and a half tile that will end up going on the back part that will be last. And then also I had mentioned yesterday about setting your first tile last, same as I do on a ledger board doing a shower. The ledger board goes and then this part, that bottom tile goes last after you run all your tile up from the ledger board. That's kind of the purpose of that. It's actually twofold. It gets me a straight line uh, for my tile to come out to and then it also gets me to the point where um, where it's straight all the way down so that the same four inches here is the same four inches back there. Um, and that's important because you don't want cockeyed tile cuts. Um, also, another thing too, this is, this is already wet and drying and all that stuff, but suppose it wasn't. Um, suppose this was yesterday and you had just finished your last tile running along this way. Um, it would be advisable to do one of two things. Either have another ledger board to put up against this tile when it dries, or you could actually run screws say two screws for each tile and making sure that everything's up against the tile and that everything's flush the way it's supposed to be. What happens with this tile sometimes is very heavy and depending on how you mix your thin set, if you mix it kind of thin, um, not thin, you know, like you're spreading it out, but, but um, kind of sloppy, these tiles have a tendency of moving over, especially the last row. They have a tendency of kind of sliding over just a little bit. So you come in the next day and this tile is away from that tile and the lines are off all the way down and it would not be fun because the only way to rectify that would be to take up um, the tile that started moving. So you don't want your tile to move and be adherent to that. If you're going to do a large area or even a small area for that matter, make sure you butt something up against it. I mean, it could, it could literally be something as simple as putting a ledger board up against the, your tile and then putting a bucket or some type of weight up against a ledger board. You don't have to necessarily put screws in the floor or whatever. I'm just giving you um, the heads up that these tile do have a tendency of moving and um, you don't want to get caught up in that. So that's about all I can tell you on this phase. As I said before, I think when I was back over here I set three tile to show you how I do it. 
but I'm not going to do a whole video on setting the tile. It's redundant. It's the same process over and over and over. So what you saw over there earlier is the same thing I'm doing here. Nothing more to it other than my cuts in the back. And so um, I can cut some tile for you if you want to watch that, but I doubt you do, so I won't. <laughs> and, and as I get to the point where I'm doing cuts around here, if it gets a little complicated with the cuts, I might in fact do a little how-to on um, how to cut the tile. But for now, I'm just going to keep on running the tile. If I run into some more information I can hand off to you, then I shall do so. So it's the next day. The rest of the tile have been set on the perimeter, back over that direction and back over here. And remember, as I said before, those last tile were the first tile. They would have been first had I done those first, um, but they ended up going last. So that ledger board kind of works, as I said before, not to be repetitive, same way as the ledger board in the shower goes, where all your tile come off of it and then the last row goes last. Anyway, um, I am ready to grout. A lot of these lines, although I try and be as neat as possible, uh, a lot of these lines will have thin set embedded in them, like right here. So I come in with a blade of some sort, it doesn't really matter. You got to be careful not to uh, damage the edge of the tile. Once you clean your thin set out, and I have to do it on the entirety of the floor. Oh, razor knife works too. Uh, once you clean your thin set out, then you're ready to grout. All that little excess powder from the thin set needs to be uh, vacuumed up. And then the grouting process takes place. This is probably the good part of three hours, about three hours of grouting. The way I grout, I will link a video below on how to grout a floor in the description box. You will click on that link and you can watch the process that I do to grout. Everybody has their own way. Over the years I've just learned that it's easier to grout as far as I can reach in front of me, no further than that, finish off that grout and then move on to the next area. There are some guys who will grout an entire area first and then go back to that area. So once I finish one little area I want to move on to the next one and not have to revisit. And so again that link is in the description box on how to grout a floor. And I'm going to get started on this. That's basically, if I could throw some tips and tricks out there on how to set a tile floor uh, in a large area, um, then that's, I guess, if, if you get anything out of this video at all, then you understand what I was trying to do here. Um, unfortunately, as I said before, I don't show myself working. Um, I think it's very boring, and um, I don't want to take up too much more time. And I hope you got something out of that, so I'm going to move on and get back to work. The grouting process is finished. Um, this has a little haze going on with it. Um, it's best not to wipe off the haze. When, sometimes when people grout, they see the haze start to dry because they're wearing the AC or the heat or whatever, and then they, they feel like they want to sponge it off again. What you're doing is digging into the grout line and pulling out more grout. You're, you're actually going backwards and then you have to put more grout in and you know it's just you're chasing your tail so the haze you wait until all the grout dries the next day and then you get a soft cloth towel t-shirt old t-shirt or whatever you wipe all that stuff off you could mop it but then you're introducing water and it's going to take longer to seal so usually you just wipe everything off you sweep it off sweep off all the sand particles because it is sanded grout um, and once that's done and you, you swept it really good, then you can go forward with the sealing process. Um, but the grouting part, um, as I said, I'll put in the description below so you can see that. And as I said, um, with regard to, to trying to uh, finish doing any type of cleaning, especially when it's wet like this, don't do it. Wait until it dries the next day or, you know, you got time wait a couple of days, um, depending on the humidity level. So, um, it's finished. <laughs>